This is a slight modification of the presentation that was done at the HPA Tech Retreat on February 23rd of 2018. So, it talks a very brief history of voice synthesis. Now, the image that I have on here, the Vox Humana, is an organ stop or a uh, certain configuration of organ pipes. What does vox humana mean? It's simply Latin for human voice. And it's one of the oldest of the organ stops. Now, how old is it? Well, frankly, we don't know. But there were organ-like instruments as early as the 3rd century BCE. And there were even programmable automatic instruments in 9th century Baghdad. You can see a reconstruction of an automated reed instrument, and a reed instrument tends to sound something like a uh, human voice. And over on the right are, is an image of the ruins of a uh, keyboard instrument from 1st century BCE in Greece. Now, it might be even earlier that um, there was voice synthesis, if you consider what animals did in trying to mimic other animals. The hill mina bird is considered one of the absolute best, and I used to spend hours in front of a mina bird uh, trying to get it to say various things, and it often would. Alexander Graham Bell, uh, well known for his work on the telephone, before he worked on the telephone, um, in theory, got his dog to say, how are you, grandmama? Uh, what he really got the dog to do was to growl, and then he would manipulate the dog's mouth to make it sound something like, how are you, grandmama? Now, more recently, you may have seen this story about how a killer whale uh, can say certain things like, hello. Well, you're about to hear it, and what sounds like uh, perhaps a bird's voice, or uh, you might think it's a dolphin. That's actually the trainer saying hello. And what follows the hello in each case is the whale. I'll let it cycle a couple of times. Hello. 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 So you can hear that the whale is definitely trying to do something that the trainer wants it to do, um, but whether anyone would recognize that as hello, not having been told that it was hello, is a different question. Um, now, getting back to mechanical devices, Pope Sylvester II uh, was Pope starting at the end of the 10th century, was said to have a brazen head, brazen just means it was bronze, that could answer questions, yes or no. Not so unreasonable. Uh, could certainly have made some sort of a, a noise, um, whether a C si or non uh, for uh, yes or no. It, it's certainly possible to have been done. In the 18th and 19th centuries, there were much more developed devices. This is a diagram of Charles Wheatstone's version in the 19th century of uh, Wolfgang von Kempelen's uh, talking machine in the late 18th century. And here's a uh, more elaborate system that was created by uh, Joseph Faber, the euphonia. On the left, you can see it without the uh, woman's dress. On the right, um, there's a mannequin and dress. But in both images, off to the left side are the keys that controlled it. And it was said to be able to converse in multiple languages, um, but always supposedly had a German accent. Now, when electronics got involved, it was initially not for synthesis. Homer Dudley was trying to come up with a way of transmitting speech over long distances with minimum bandwidth. You may consider it the um, MP3 of uh, the 1930s, if you will. Um, so he divided the speech into different spectral bands and had switches for reconstructing it. Um, and then there were two World's Fairs coming up, one in New York and one in San Francisco. And so 
it seemed possible to take the same device and instead of having the input come from a microphone, just have the input come from uh, keys that could be depressed on a pitch pedal. And so the vocoder or voice coder, which was this transmission system, became the voter or voice demonstrator. And uh, this is what the uh, apparatus looked like at the New York World's Fair in 1939. There's one of the operators. There were two sets of five keys and a wrist bar and also the uh, pitch pedal. Now, here's a big spoiler alert for those of you who have not yet seen the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey. It came out in 1968. Um, the story is uh, about a um, journey into deep space, and it's uh, going to take a long time, so much of the crew is in suspended animation and uh, there is an artificial intelligence, the HAL 9000. Uh, HAL is one letter short of IBM in each letter position. Um, and something goes wrong with it and it kills the crew and there's only one person left. And so that person decides it has he has to uh, disable the higher reasoning centers of the HAL 9000 um, so that um, he will have a safe trip. And in the course of uh, knocking out the higher reasoning centers, the artificial intelligence reverts to an earlier time. And um, it talks about its training session and how it learned to sing a song. So here's that section. My instructor was Mr. Langley, and he taught me to sing a song. If you'd like to hear it, I can sing it for you. Yes, I'd like to hear it, Hal. Sing it for me. It's called Daisy. So, um, I won't continue with that as it goes on and gets slower and lower in pitch all the time, but why did that appear in 2001? Well, here is something that uh, accompanied the Library of Congress adding Daisy Bell or Bicycle Bell for Two to the National Registry of Recorded Sound in 2009. and. They are crediting not the person who wrote the song, uh, Harry Daker, but Max Matthews, John Kelly, and Carol Lockbaum, um, who did a performance in, well, sort of did a performance in 1961. And at the right side of this, you can see a poster for 2001 uh, Space Odyssey. Um, now, why is that there? Well, it's because Max Matthews programmed a computer to play the tune of Daisy, and John Kelly and Carol Lockbaum uh, worked on programming the voice singing Daisy, and both the writer of 2001 A Space Odyssey, Arthur C. Clarke, and the director of the movie, Stanley Kubrick, went to Bell Labs and heard the song Daisy uh, as it was performed by an IBM 704 computer. This is an IBM 704 computer and even with a computer that large at that time it was not possible to output in real time. It took an hour to output just 17 seconds and this is what it sounded like. Here is a duet with a later program. I 
So I think we can all agree that the um, programming got better between 1961 and 1990. It also uh, became real time. But why this concentration on singing? Well, here is an opera that was performed in 1975 at Carnegie Recital Hall in New York. And the composer is uh, down there at the bottom, Joseph Olive, who also worked at Bell Labs. The opera was called Marie Ia and it's an opera about a um, female scientist who invents a talking computer and the computer is in love with her as its creator and she's in love with it as um, it, her um, development and then she decides that this is not a great love which is sort of the plot of the opera. Um, the female scientist was played by a soprano, the talking computer was played by a singing computer, again with all this singing. And uh, here's the voter singing in 1939. <laughs> Now we might complain that uh, it was a little bit out of tune or it wasn't the best rendition of Old Lang Syne, but I think the tune was quite recognizable. But here is the same voter talking and uh, an announcer is going to say what he wants the voter to say. Will you please make the voters say for our Eastern listeners, good evening, radio audience. And now for our Western listeners, say, good afternoon, radio audience. Well, you can sort of tell from that why there was all this singing, because if you have a recognizable tune, you can tell what the song is, even if you can't quite make out the words. Now, the voter at times was much better than that. The voter could speak in different languages uh, with appropriate accents. It could sound like a pig or a cow or other animals, um, but sometimes it didn't sound all that great. But if you um, had it play Old Lang Syne, everybody knew what the tune was. So the same reason was used for why when Arthur C. Clarke and Stanley Kubrick came to Bell Labs, they heard the song Daisy, because if it was a song, um, then people could identify it right away. And, oh, isn't this amazing that a computer can sing? Um, but for talking, it was a little bit more difficult. Of course, things did improve. So by 1984, Digital Equipment Corporation, or DEC, came out with this much smaller and simpler and real-time system. Um, there's a cat for size comparison. It was called DEC Talk. And in the room with us today, we have someone, Nancy Burke, who uh, programmed a DEC Talk system to sing. And Stevie Wonder um, was entranced by the singing, and she got to sell him a system and install it. And it makes perfect sense that he might use it, say, for listening uh, to his mail. Uh, by the way, the, the voice is the same as the voice that you commonly think of as Stephen Hawking's voice. Um, but... She might not have sold the system had she not programmed it to sing. So now you know why there's all this singing in speech synthesis.